stream. Oh, there we go. I'm live. Finally. Sorry. It was spinning for like two and a half hours. That might be a slight exaggeration, everybody. Welcome to Plus YouTube Live. My name is Trisha Griffith. This is Scrappy Joe here to present and here to mind his own business and yours is Boo the Cat, who will do everything possibly obnoxious that he can in front of the camera. Oh my gosh, I have lipstick on my teeth. It's just one of those days, people. But the good news is, with us tonight, we have two amazing people. Amy from True Crime Sushi. How are you, Amy? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me. Good. And also joining us is Jim Rathman. And uh, Jim, former Secret Service agent, former uh, detective, homicide detective, pretty much has done everything possible in law enforcement. How are you tonight, Jim Rathman? I'm doing real good. Thank you very much for having me. And what's going on, Amy? <laughs> I'm just excited. I'm excited to hear what you have to well, say. It's a great day because I feel that justice was served. Everybody was worried that uh, uh, Derek Chauvin would not get the justice that people feel felt he deserved. Um I was worried when the jury came back so quickly because I had shades of O.J. Simpson in my brain, but they found Derek guilty of everything, of second degree murder, of, uh, is it third degree murder, and of manslaughter. I mean, he got the whole shebang, people. But there's something called the, the Blakely motion. And Jim Rathman, I'm going to turn to you for an explanation on what that really is. What does that mean? And, and was it filed in this case and what's going on with it concerning this case? Yeah, I'm gonna explain this the best that I can because I'm not an attorney, but um, what the Blakely waiver is, is when he was charged with the second degree and third degree in the manslaughter, it could be viewed as aggravated circumstances, which would actually enhance the penalty. Mm -hmm. um, and the jury would be able to make that decision. What he did was he waived the jury from being able to make that decision, which then puts it solely on the judge. So the judge will then view, is there aggravated circumstances to this, which would enhance penalties, maybe even enhance how much time can be served in jail mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. So that's what he waived. Um, he waived that, I believe it was yesterday. He, he waived that option so the jury won't be able to determine the aggravated circumstances and strictly be the judge. And why is that? Why do you, why did he do that? Cause he felt the jury would just do it automatically. Well, I mean, it's hard to really say, I'm not sure what uh, his attorney was advising him to do at that time, but I'm sure he, I mean, he was in the courtroom every day. He saw what was going on. He saw the jury's reaction. I mean, he's able to literally look over and see, all 12 members of that jury and what their reactions are and getting the feel of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So he probably knew that they're going to find him guilty. And therefore, let me see if the judge will then, you know, hope maybe the judge won't find the aggravated circumstances where the um, jury most likely would have. Right. So that's the only thing that I can think of. And that's just clearly from being a spectator on that. Uh, we're talking with Jim Rathman, former Secret Service. Now uh, that you will see him on Discovery ID constantly. He is an amazing private detective. And I had the great pleasure and honor of working with Jim uh, during a, an incredible Discovery ID three-part series about, um, uh, oh my God, my, my mind just went totally blank. It was called... Um, Jim, what was it called? My God, I can't forget. I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> Joe Exotic, Tigers, Lies, and Cover Up. Joe Exotic, Tigers, Lies, and Cover Up. I couldn't, I could remember the Tigers, Lies, and Cover Up. I just couldn't remember Joe Exotic. And anyway, he did some like, amazing work there. And you will see him, like I said, a lot on Discovery ID. Jim, being former law enforcement, and you have been obviously in several different areas of law enforcement. What does this verdict mean to you? Do you think this is going to help heal things? But as a law enforcement person, how do you look at this verdict? Well, I mean, from the get-go on this, what I viewed several months ago, the first time those videos came out, I reviewed it just the same as the rest of the public. Is This, this was a bad apple within law enforcement that was clearly acting on his own and in a completely inappropriate way. Um, that, that it wasn't 
there was no need to do what he did. I understand that Mr. Floyd may have resisted in the beginning and therefore they had to use force to get him in handcuffs. I don't think anybody would, would argue that point. But the moment the handcuffs go on, you've got to stop. You have to de-escalate, and you can't do that. And the guy's claiming he can't breathe. Help him to breathe, you know. So, obviously, there was a lot of problems with the entire incident that uh, Officer Chauvin or Derek Chauvin did. You know, I think today is a step in the right direction when it comes to I, I, this officer was wrong and needed to be convicted. And was convicted. He was convicted by a member of, or by 12 jury members, his peers, mm -hmm. you know, and they convicted him on all counts as they should. You know, I think that this is a step in a very, very, very long road um, going forward. Um, you know, I think there should be a lot of police chiefs, sheriffs, mayors um, that are probably looking at what's going on and, and Ron, they need to understand that there's a real problem out there today. You know, you have a lot of the general public that don't have the trust in law enforcement anymore. Right, right. And you need to be able to bridge those gaps. And the best way to do that is you have to start communicating and you have to start inviting people from those communities to come forward and have them work as a part of your administration and really be able to help you help them and their communities and what really needs to happen. You have to open your hearts. You have to open your mind. You got to listen. I mean, the biggest key is, is listen mm -hmm. and, you know, be prepared for constructive criticism and accept it because if you don't start listening, we're not going to be able to make the steps forward. And like I said, this is just a, this is just a step and a very long road in my opinion. Jim, do you think it is the training that needs to change or the type of people that they let into law enforcement? You know, like with any profession, you're going to have your bad apples here and there. I, I, I mean, I, I'm one to, that believes that you can always train and you can always learn more. Um, you know, I can relate back to many years ago, and you can go back further than that. You know, it was community-orientated policing. That's what cops stood for. And so you used to have people that would actually walk the beat, as they referred to it as, you know, and so they knew every house, they knew all the people's names, they knew all the children, they knew everybody and everything that went on in that area. That doesn't exist anymore. You have much larger patrol sections, you're in vehicles all day long, you're dealing with computers and radios, and you're not getting out there and communicating with the public. And I think that's where it started to slip. And I think a lot of it needs to go back to where you actually are involved and actively involved within the communities that you're walking the beat on and, and really getting to know those in your community. That's what it was called community oriented policing. And I wish they would be able to go back to that a little bit more. And, you know, I, I think that you could always learn more. You can always do more training, but bring through the right training, you know, and, and bridge those gaps. Well, I, and, and I agree with you. I think if, um, if the police knew the people that they are actually dealing with, like knew them, and knew where they lived and knew their circumstances, I think it would be a whole different situation. I mean, granted, computers are fantastic, cell phones are the best, but there's nothing like human to human contact to help heal people, that's for sure. Uh, we do have a question from the chat room and it comes from Marilyn Landis, wants to know, did Jim go to Columbia for Joe Exotic, Tiger's Lies, um, good Lord, did you go for uh, Joe Exotic? Did you go to Columbia? I did not go to Columbia. Have you thought about? Columbia? And are you talking about Costa Rica? Is I think what they're oh, referring yes, to. Yes, yes. Uh, COVID, Costa COVID's, Costa COVID's, pro yeah. COVID's provided a lot of um, a lot of issues when it comes to being able to travel internationally and film. At least back when we originally um, filmed for the TV show, so there was a lot of. Uh, issues that were at play there. So hope maybe maybe you'll be coming sometime in the near future. You're just going to have to wait and see. Do you think, Jim, there might be a Joe Exotic Tigers Lies and Cover-Ups 2 in the works, maybe? It's possible. You know, right now, um, there's just so much that's been going on with, mm -hmm. you know, Joe Exotic and his, and his trial. I mean, he's got a wonderful new attorney and John Phillips and John, I can assure you is, is really going above and beyond to help Joe in his case. Um, you know, and bringing those that they believe had maybe even lied under oath and so on. And he's going to expose all of that and then bring that all forward. 
Um, so you have that aspect of it going to Costa Rica, you know, to get more information and do that. Maybe when COVID's lifted and things are better for international travel, it's always a possibility. I'm not going to say no, um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Well, and so what do you have coming up in the future? Is there anything that you can uh, tell us about or give us a hint about? Um, you know, there's a, there's a few, there's a few opportunities that are out there right now. One of them I wanted to, I want to say so badly, but I know, uh, <laughs> I know that, uh, Rebecca Sermons would, would crush my spirits if I did. So I'm going to hold off on being able to say that one. Um, there's also a possibility of working a case. I've actually gotten to know this family very well over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's in North Georgia. And I'm really hoping to be able to go there because that is one there where a case needs justice mm -hmm. um, and justice can we can really overturn uh, what was ruled a suicide and actually be able to showcase that it was a homicide and back it up with all the facts and data and everything to go with it. And there's a family there that needs that justice and they've been doing everything they can to get it. And hopefully we'll be able to provide that soon. So, um, Stay tuned. We're going to have some good announcements coming up here in the very near future. You know, Jim, those cases are so hard uh, to deal with because more often than not, it is a suicide and it's just hard for the parents to accept it. But when you tell me that the evidence is there, that it is not a suicide, I absolutely believe it. And if anybody can get justice for this family, it is you, Jim Rathman. There is no doubt in my mind. Amy, my darling, are you still here? I hope. I'm still here. Do you have any questions? And if not, I just want to ask you about your thoughts for today on the verdict. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, obviously, it's what we had all had hoped. I think that some of us were a little bit nervous at one point. Um, it'll be interesting to see what his sentencing is. Um and what they're going to do with him once they do sentence him, because he can't be, you know, he's, I imagine he'll have to be under special protection. I would think so. Um, Jim, yeah. do you think, do you think that's uh, what will happen at do when law enforcement is arrested and they have to go to prison? Do you know if they get special protection? Oh, they get special protection leading up to the trial if they're incarcerated. Um, you know, I really don't know what they're going to do with him. I mean, obviously they have to try to minimize the risk the best they can. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know where you can put him anywhere in the United States that he wouldn't be a target. Oh, that's so true. not sure, not sure how they're going to do it. Um, I, I mean, death row inmates are usually on their own, uh, in their own cells for 23 hours out of the day. I don't know what they're going to do with, with their children, but, uh, you know, there's a, there was actually talk that he was going to be sent to a federal prison for his protection. Do you know, I, I don't know the difference between federal and state. They're both prison. Is federal more tight and they have like more guards or what's what's the deal there? No, I mean, it, I think a lot of it comes from location and the types of criminals are there and maybe the ability to be able to provide someone a little bit more protection in a in a system such as that the only differences i truly know about in regards to the state and federal is really when it comes to the amount of time served you know typically when when you're convicted in a state court and you're charged through the state for every one day you serve in jail you get one good day so if you get a five-year sentence you can technically be out two and a half years and do the remainder two and a half on probation oh, wow. in federal in federal you only get one good day a month Ooh. So you do a five-year sentence and, you know, you're only getting out, what, two months early? Yeah. So that's the, that's the big difference between state and federal. But when it comes to the protection aspect of it, I, I, don't, I don't know. I can reach out to some Bureau of Prison um, people that I know and see what they can tell me about that. Yeah, and next time you're on, you can you could tell us all about that. And I still, um, everybody, I want you to know I've tried desperately to uh, – make Jim tell spill secrets about uh, his secret service time protecting presidents and world leaders, but he refuses. And I know I'm still working on him. We're going to get you to spill those secrets, Jim. That's all there is to it. Maybe one day. Maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry. What Amy? 
It's that we won't tell anyone. I know. It's just us. I mean, that's what I don't get. It's just us. <laughs> uh, Jim, what uh, can you give us your Twitter and your, if you have a Facebook page and a, a website, to give us all your handles so people can visit you, please. Yeah, Instagram is at the real Jim Rathman. Mm -hmm. uh, it's two ends of my last name, so at the real Jim Rathman. Twitter is at real Jim Rathman, and Facebook is Jim Rathman. Um, and my company website is jimrathmanthecompany.com. That all makes perfect so. sense, and we'll put all of that in the description as well. Jim Rathman, thank you for taking the time out today on such short notice. I really appreciate your help, and uh, my again. Pleasure. We appreciate you coming on and, and filling us in on the details. Thank you, sir. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You both have a wonderful night. You too now, Jim. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Hang on here. I put his stuff in the chat, just so you know. Oh, you did? Oh, thank you. That's I appreciate that. That's a big help. So, okay. Let me turn you up, Miss Amy. Turn you up just a little bit. Oh boy. Yeah. It has been, uh, it's just been a crazy day. I don't know about the rest of you, but it has been, I have not even had a chance to take a look and see how things are in Minnesota. Amy, have you, are, are things okay or. I haven't, I haven't, I saw the reaction to the verdict and I saw some, you know, statements that were made publicly by different groups, but as far as how the, how the city is doing i haven't i can look it up right now okay if you wouldn't mind that'd be great and in the meantime let me just check in chat and see how everybody's doing oh honey boo please hi he Shay. good to see you oh, boo you're making me crazy exactly beauty for ashes rest in peace mr floyd i mean it's just Today, when the verdict came down, before the verdict came down, I sat for nine minutes. First, I did nine minutes just chatting and said, okay, start the clock. And then I said, hey, that's nine minutes, long time. Then I did it silently and sat silent for nine minutes. Actually, nine and a half minutes. And that's how long uh, yeah. Chauvin's knee was on his neck. It was a long time, Amy. It was a long time. And they have it on video and he has a smug look on his face and he's refusing help and he doesn't even get off when the ambulance pulls up you know he it uh, i i my theory is uh he realized when uh george floyd when his respiration was bad and going down and there's a certain um a certain type of of respiration that when someone's dying uh and if you've seen it you know it and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if he knew it and he knew that's what was happening. And he just froze, just froze, froze. He knew his life was over because he had just killed this man. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Amy, what are your, uh, what's your opinion and your theory? <sighs> you know, my opinion is, is, is the same as everybody else's. I don't have anything new to to offer, um, it's disgusting. Right. The whole senseless, and um, I, I can't even wrap my head around it. And I, I know I've said this before about other cases, but I'm glad I can't because that means that hopefully I'm a normal, healthy person. <laughs> yeah. It was, I, it's hard to wrap your mind around what he did. It really is. It is. And I, I can't, I can't grasp what, what was going through his head while he was doing it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, because it, when you, when you watch it or when you read about it or when you think about it, the, I don't know what the word is, but the arrogance, the stubbornness, the cruelty, and the lack of human compassion mm -hmm. amp up as that nine and a half minute clock is ticking. Right. You know, because he, ha he had an opportunity. He did. He had he did. a couple. Absolutely. But 
where he, not that it's important to me, because it's not, mm-hmm. but where he could have saved space. He could have at and some he, point. If he'd have just went, oh, okay, I better get off. Oh, God, they're right. Let's yeah. make sure he lives, you know? Right, right. So, yeah. Um, RS says it's peef- uh, peaceful in Minnesota by the Cup Foods new uh, store. That's where that happened. Amy, excuse me, did you find uh, anything going on in Minnesota? No, it seems to be very good. Very, yeah. That, that's yeah. very good to hear. And, um, you know, I. I, I just, I don't understand how people can look at what he did and listen to the judge with the charges. You know, he explained them. He explained what second degree murder, uh, what mm-hmm. he did, you know, the, the level that the crime has to be to be second degree. Second degree does not have premeditation. It just, and basically means you did something so stupid that you should have known it was going to kill somebody. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you drive behind the wheel drunk and you kill someone, you can be charged with second degree murder. Um, If you take a knife and you want to fight a guy and you have a knife and you stab him, we can say, well, I wasn't meaning to kill him. Yeah. But you brought a knife to fight. Yeah. You knew something was going to happen. You know, so and this is the this is the case. He he should have known. Well, I think he did know, but he should have known that that was killing him, and he could have at any time stopped it. And like you said, he could have saved face. That it would have been so much better. But uh, yeah, you know, he, he, we could have had George Floyd still alive and Derek Chauvin with a disciplinary action. Right there, you go. And everybody walks away mm-hmm. and. Everybody lives now. Um, you know, we have a dead man, and basically, we have. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how to say this. As much as Chauvin deserves to have his, I'm so sorry, Scrappy. <laughs> there's nobody there. You know, hold on. I better check. There might be somebody there. I thought I heard something too. Hang on. You go check. I'll look at the chat. Okay, thank you. Say hi to chat. Who's there, Scrappy? I thought I heard someone too, actually. Hold on. Yeah, Leah Vogel, that, you know, the condo that he had down in Florida is very near where I live. And I, I'm not going to lie, I was tempted to like drive by when all that stuff was going on. He's, um, his life is done. You know, I, I don't really care, but I mean, I came for trial, <laughs> but hi, twin mom, 2011. Okay. No, uh, no monsters at the door. Okay, good. That I, that unless they're hiding, which they probably are, they're probably everywhere. Anyway, you know, I am curious about, and I'm not saying this because I'm saying he's a victim or anything, but I am curious about Derek Chauvin's childhood. Yeah. Because what would make somebody want to be a cop, which really to be a police officer, you want to, you should want to be helpful, you know, not mean and show your power. And I'm wondering, I'd be really curious to see if, um, he came close to failing a psychological exam, but just maybe passed under the wire. I'd be really curious to see what his upbringing was like, what his father was like, what his mother was like. Um, I I think there are, again, it's a learning thing. We can all learn, you know, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Let's find out and find out what, you know, what demons in his past Uh that type of behavior. And it always is, it always is something in your past when you do something horrific that, you know, it makes you think it's okay to do and it's not, it's just not. So I don't know. Well, and on on the flip side, I, you know, when I was working in public relations and we had, you know, the personal protection logistics team Mm -hmm. and things like that, the, the agents that didn't work out, and I mean, this was pretty high level stuff, but the agents that did not work out, 
it wasn't necessarily always something that happened in their youth because, um, you know, they're screened for a lot of that. Right. And but they, not for a lot of it. They are screened for that, mm-hmm. you know, that build out like seven people out and all kinds of stuff. I mean, right. it's, it's crazy. This is just my observation, but I watched a couple of people get built up with accolades or exposure to people and starting to get drunk on the power and authority. Really? And that work out for them. Mm-hmm. Wow. And yeah. Say, there you go. That could be it. You know, it, and, and on a smaller scale, Amy, and I think everybody in chat, everybody listening will be able to relate to this. You've gone on the internet and you've seen somebody that maybe has a few followers and, you know, likes on their Facebook page. Maybe they, you know, do a podcast and they have a few people following them, following them and they too get drunk with power. They think mm-hmm. that they're just cool and they become arrogant. And I can see that, especially in that line of work. I can see it. Uh, well, especially if you're responsible. So here's where I saw it. Mm-hmm. I saw it where it wasn't always like a veteran agent. You know what I mean? Like it would be somebody in their 40s, kind of like mid-career. Right. 45, mid-career, mm-hmm. right? Right. According to my standards anyway, mid-career. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and they would be responsible for the mentoring or the training or the grooming of the next generation. Mm-hmm. And then it was, it began with posturing and it began with, you know, being braggadocious and kind of like, Hey, this is, you know, this is how you can do this or get away with it. Or look what I did here or whatever. And that's when you knew, not that it was my call, but because they were, contract it through my company and have to go to the person in charge and say like hey are you seeing this because this isn't cool exactly. and it's usually because they're showing off and so i only say this because i can create a direct parallel with chauvin you mm-hmm. know most of the people around him he was responsible for or he was training or grooming right very good so point. very good point you know um, it, it, it could be as sad and sick as it is. It could be an example of just like doing something and it going too far and then having too much pride, too much ego to back out and at the expense of a human life. Yep. I think you're right. I, I, I believe that 100%. Uh, Lisa Hogan said, I read that t- he was an only child and his parents divorced when he was young. And that could be true. Very well could be true. Uh, somebody else asked, didn't his wife divorce him? Yes, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Derek's wife filed for divorce shortly after the video came out. And It was with 72 hours, I believe. Was it really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And that really surprised everybody. But, you know, you have to think, was that just the final straw? She just said, no, I am so done. I am out of here, which is too bad because you have to wonder, you know, does he experience warmth and joy and happiness or is he just a mean SOB? And, you know, I I don't know. Well, they had. They had some financial issues too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I was just, while you were away, I was in the chat and, and talking at the same time just a little bit. But, you know, they had a condo down here in Florida, him and his wife. Oh, they did? Yes. And when all this happened, there were protesters outside the condo. It was a gated community and mm-hmm. it was a big deal. And, I, you know, I, I was curious. I kind of wanted to drive by, but I didn't. You, didn't, yeah. you know, um, because just because of the kind of case it is. Um, but you know, I am being judgy here. But I'm thinking, how does the cop afford? And when I'm talking about a nice neighborhood, mm-hmm. like nice neighborhood, Did like his- unless Airbnb being that thing for like twenty five hundred dollars you know, right. every three days. I don't know. I I wonder if we're going to find out more. 
Well, we could, we could. And do you think, mate, could his wife have been making a lot of money maybe? Perhaps. Maybe there's family money. I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, part of me is a little, like, you're suspicious. That makes you suspicious. It does. It does. Because I, I had a friend that was married to a cop that ended up getting in a lot of trouble and she could never figure out where the money was coming from. <laughs> yeah. So. If you have, a, if you're married to a cop and all of a sudden you're getting cars and condos and boats. Yeah. And, yeah. Then it's a problem. Yeah. Well, uh, I wonder, uh, you know, again, the fact that Chauvin did what he did to George Floyd. I could see him doing anything. Couldn't you, Amy? I mean, I really could. I really could. Oh, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think anybody that could do that would would do anything. And maybe, you know, maybe there's going to be a big overhaul in that whole police department. I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, let's see. Amy, when you were talking about the those men at your work, and mm-hmm. um, you saw them, you know, start to groom these younger people coming in. Did you know any of them very well? Or because uh, I'm just wondering what causes somebody to turn into that type of like almost like a megalomaniac, like they they're drunk with power and they like um you know, humiliating people and, and making fun of people who they think are beneath them, you know, just like, mm-hmm. a, just like a sixth grader almost. Did you ever get to know any of these guys personally very well? And if so, is there anything you can tell us about their personality that would help us understand what the mm-hmm. flip is going on? Well, um, yeah, I did. There were a couple of them. One of them eventually was put on, like, for lack of a better word, like administrative duties. Mm-hmm. Like, didn't travel and didn't have access to the kind of people we were working with anymore. And how come? Um, how come you got put on that? Um, over familiar. Um, you find, um, you know, all these non you know, NDAs and stuff like right, that. Right. Um, you know, like for me, like some of the people I worked with, I can, I can never in my lifetime talk about them. Right. I just can't. I could be, you know, I don't think anybody go after me, but right. um, am I going to take that chance? No. And I take my job seriously. So exactly. I, I don't. Um, but it became like you, you start noticing the, the, the signs, like, Maybe you're on you're on a three day whatever, and you're everybody's checked into the hotel. All your VIPs are secure for the night, and everybody goes somewhere to have a drink, like a public place. Right. And you start dropping or talking really loud because mm-hmm. people to know that you're yeah what you do. what you know. Mm. Uh, then there's things like crossing lines and um, bad habits and stuff like that. And I can't really go into m- to much of that except to tell you that the best way if you're one of those guys and you have some bad habits or you're doing some nefarious things, mm-hmm. when you bring in new people, you have eyes on you, right? And right. you're still doing them. Right. What better way than to bring them in to your secret circle and then nobody can narc on you. Well, there you go. God, I never thought of that. That's a great point. So that, you that can, was, yeah. you know, that was one of the things that, you know, we kind of dealt with mm-hmm. from time to time. He was their children like, Oh, you know, when we walk through this area of town, this, I go pick up, you know, I was like, we could always find somebody here or you need it, you know, whatever it is. And I, I hate even talking about it because, I, I respect law enforcement. I know. Me too. Me too. You know, so I, I, I know that this is a drop in the bucket person and not representative of, of, you know, everybody, but it's the same way with, you know, um, with agents. I think 
Um, one of the things that those two professions have in common mm -hmm. is that they come out of the military, right. where very controlled mm -hmm. and controlling other people. Right. Good point. And it's a, um, I don't know, like a hazing payback, whether you're, you're under them training or you're somebody on the street. And it's like, you know, you look down at them with disdain and disgust and you decide to, um, you know, if you're a regular citizen and you're, you're a bad person and you look down upon people, normally you're not going to go up to that person and start telling them what a piece of garbage you think they are. Right. You know? Right. Okay. But if you're in a position of authority or power, mm -hmm. you and do you that. have your urges, you can almost do it with justification. Mm -hmm. Like, you, not really, but in your mind. Sure, in your you own can mind. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and I've so, got people thinking about those type of people they've met through their lives. You know, if you think back, you've run into people like that and mm -hmm. you just have to wonder. A couple of quick things here. Lee Vogel said that uh, Chauvin has like 22 complaints of excessive force over 19 years and none resulted in discipline. You know, mm -hmm. 22 complaints. Yeah, it's over 19 years, but I don't know. Anyway, and uh, Elena Mandel says police officers seek power and domination through positive or negative actions. Well. I could, that very well could be true. Hi, Tina. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. But you say, you see the same kind of behavior. So there's different kinds of power, right? Right. There's power in wearing a badge and having a weapon, mm -hmm. right? Right. There's power in being wealthy. Have you ever seen somebody very uh, wealthy or famous treat other people badly? All the time, yeah. Right. Because, you know, whether it's their staff or their, well, staff and employees right. or out in public service industry people. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sure. Yeah. Know, like that kind of stuff. So I think it's like a, um, I, I would say it's a personality type, but I almost think it's kind of like a chip on your shoulder thing. I think so too. Uh, yeah, it could be. It could be a personality type for some, and a chip on your shoulder for others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. In fact, hold on one second. Oh, thank you, Veronica Lynn says, "Great job, mods." I agree, one hundred percent. Mary Rose says, "The guards at Gitmo." Now, this is interesting. We're going to talk about a science experiment that just went crazy. Uh, the guards at Gitmo, who started normal, said they became sadists from working there. That's true. Now, there was a uh, an experiment, and I want to say it was at Stanford University in the early 70s. Do you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. And they mm -hmm. had to end it because it got so bad. This was, it mm -hmm. was a class, and, um, you know, they were all friends, and there was, it was a great class. I think it was about psychology. And the teacher divided them in half. One side were prisoners. The other side were guards. And that was it. That was it. The guards had control of the prisoners. It got so bad where the guards were just so cruel and mean. And they all just, you know, uh, started attacking the prisoners and just doing horrible things. They, they had to stop the experiment because it just got out of hand. And uh, I yeah, I wish I could remember what they said after they when they stopped it after the interview. But it was basically like the Gitmo guards. It was mm -hmm. like, well, you know. I was a guard and everybody started doing it. So I started doing it and it just, it was amazing how quickly it got out of hand. Is that the same one you're thinking of? Yeah, it's exactly the same one. And I always, I always think about, you know how they say there's no new stories. There's just not like, right. if you see them, it's based on like something that's been <laughs> told a million times over. It's just new characters, new setting, whatever. So not the oldest story ever told, but Lord of the Flies. Oh, well, there you, you are, go. Yeah, that, that absolutely right. Lord of Flies, perfect example. Perfect when example. You, when you create a new little microcosm and they are somewhat cut off from 
from the rest of the world. They form their own societies, and these archetypes just organically develop. You always have the type figure or the the um, you know the martyr. The you have you know you you have all these things, and um, you definitely saw that in in the Stanford experiment. Yes, exactly. Uh, and let's see. Hold on. Let's see. Oh yeah. Lee Vogel says, Trisha, imagine the ones uh, not reported because they thought no one would believe them. That's what worries me, Amy, is how many uh, cops like Derek Chauvin are out there that aren't reported because they won't be believed or maybe they have reported them and they won't believe them because maybe they're on the uh, you know wrong side of society, if you will. I, I don't know. It just, again, it is, you do have power when you're a police officer flat out have power and well, and then very intimidating too because there's that brotherhood and so you accuse the police officer of doing something and not you don't just have to worry about in your mind you don't have to worry about him mm -hmm. you have about who he's connected to like right. who supports him. exactly exactly uh and just a quick note here i forgot who said it but uh somebody reported that uh in chat that Chauvin's wife divorced him. Was it two days after the George Floyd video came out? It was really soon after that. It was even sooner than I thought. But anyway, yeah. those types of personalities can be, uh, they're destructive and they have no business being in law enforcement. And I, in my opinion, which, you know, again, I'm great at Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking always, but I do believe that they have to change the type of people that become cops. I think they need, just like Jim Rathman was saying, somebody that wants to be uh, out there in the community. You want to hire people that want to help, not uh -huh. the ones that want to hurt or to harm or to, you know, kick somebody's butt or whatever. You know, you, you well, got Yeah, definitely. And you have to, just because somebody's been on, you know, with a precinct or on the force or whatever term you're going to use for 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, doesn't there need to be some sort of like review, look think. at them, you know, do they need a refresher course? Do they need to do, do they need to take, be taken off their regular duty and go back out, you know, to like he said, walking the beat right. again. Right, exactly. Just I, so you don't lose touch and we know who you are. Right, exactly right. And once the cop learns the people and, and knows the people, I think the dynamic changes and they become more helper rather than not. Now, again, let's not uh, forget about the horrific, awful things cops face every single day, things that would just horrify us, but they have to deal with, and it's really hard, you know, and you do mm -hmm. have to be a certain type of person to be able to deal with those types of things. And, you know, me, I'd be like a bawling, sniveling mess within 20 minutes of being on patrol, probably. So again, I don't, I wish I had the answers. I just know the answer is not more aggression and more anger and tougher cops. That's not it. Um, it, uh, you know, I always, I always told everybody, if I could teach my son compassion at an early age, then he's going to be just fine. And, and we did. We taught him compassion. And I've always felt that because if you have compassion, you know, then you, you will understand other people's struggles and, and hopefully people understand your struggle. Anyway, it's my, my uh, ridiculous philosophy. Uh, and I will be writing a book soon within 30 to 90 years, right around that time. I'm not sure when. Hey, I, oh, what, Amy, yes. what were you going to say? I, I don't think that's ridiculous at all. <laughs> I, well, you know, I just, I just feel compassion is, um, you, you gotta, you gotta teach people young to have compassion, uh, because yes. compassion also equates to being responsible. You know, you're responsible at your work because you don't want somebody else to have to do it because you have compassion for them. You show up mm -hmm. on time because you don't want somebody to have to wait, you know? So it just, to me, it covers all the areas that you need in life. If you can have a lot of compassion. So, and you got to right. learn, learn how to save money that, you know, 
It, that's one thing they don't teach in school anymore. And I wish they would. I know. Okay, Amy, I want to talk about what's going on tomorrow night. Okay? Oh. It's going to be ah. big, people. I have um, the great honor of talking with Charles Chaz Smith. And he grew up with Prince. They are cousins. First cousins grew up together. You know how you are with your cousins. You're more like siblings. Well, Prince and Charles are more like brothers. And um, Prince died of an overdose. But there's more to it than that. Since the day Charles Smith got that ter got the terrible news that Prince was gone and, and the cause of death, you know, he told his wife Veronica right then, something's not right and I'm going to find out what's going on. And he has been working for five years to try and find the people responsible for you know, giving Prince the drugs. And what was, I mean, there's just a lot to it. And uh, it's, it's so sad that there should be like just hordes of people in Prince's family trying to find out and, and trying to, you know, do the right thing. And it seems like it's just Charles Smith and his wife. I could be wrong, but um, it just seems like it's just, it's just them. And I want to stress again, Charles Smith gets nothing for doing this. He's, there's no will. He wasn't in the will. There's no money for him. There is nothing other than the love for his cousin who was like a brother. He wants to find out what really happened. And he's going to join us tomorrow night after a vigil for Prince. It's going to be tomorrow night. And let me put the link up. Let me grab the link uh, to the vigil here really quickly. It has all the information about the vigil. And uh, Tomorrow night, it's going to be five years that we lost Prince. I can't believe it's been that long. Can you? No. When you said it the other night, mm -hmm. I thought, no. I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I literally in my, of course, we all lost a year on, on in 2020, I right. think, because of everything oh, that sure. occurred. But I was thinking, well, three years then. Mm -hmm. Three years. I believe it's been five. I know. My God. It just seems like yesterday. It really does. Um, and it was such a shock because Prince and I are the exact same age. And he was, I think he was 58 when he died. And I was just like, I can't believe it. You know, it was just, oh, it was awful. It was just awful. Hold on here. Here is a link. It is to the sponsor of the, uh, of the vigil tomorrow night. Okay. So hang on. Let me put that in there. There you go. Okay. And when you click on that, it takes you to a Facebook page and you scroll down. Oh, no. It takes you right to the Facebook page. Uh, it's called Funkatopia Presents a Candlelight Vigil Remembering Prince. And uh, as Charles Smith says, keep it purple. I love that. You know, there was the movie Purple Rain. I remember seeing that. And just thinking, man, that, that that guy is so talented. Who is he? Where did he come from? You know, he was just amazing. So tomorrow night, uh, what we're going to do tomorrow night is um, we'll go over Prince's career. And we'll, we'll talk about true crime things, but we'll we'll get you up to speed on on Prince's life and, and what he was doing, what he has accomplished, and uh, the night of his death. And then after the vigil, Charles Smith, and I hope, his wife, uh, Victoria, joins him because she is really amazing. She truly is a great lady. So are, are you a Prince fan, Amy? Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, he's iconic. It doesn't matter what kind of music you like. You have to respect him for his talent, he's very, in my very opinion. Talented. Yeah, very talented. So um, I, I, I hope you'll join us. It's something uh, a little bit different than what we have done before, but we are spreading our wings, people. We're going to do different things because 2021, we're going to start to live again. And uh, we're going to be out and about. You know, I'm going to be in Dallas and I'll be able to go to all kinds of trials and annoy so many more people than I can just sitting here in, YouTube, <laughs> in this cabin. I can't wait. I can't wait. So uh, let's just say hi to chat, see how everybody's doing in here. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I am so far behind in chat. Just to keep strolling. Oh yeah, Veronica Lynn. Prince's Super Bowl uh, performance, amazing. In fact, I'm going to make a note of that and get that link so we can watch it tomorrow because that was, I remember that. That was incredible. You know, he, he just had, he was just oozing talent. Everything about him, you know? He was. And he, um, you know, he like, he, he crossed some boundaries and he was like in a interesting way and very, he, he was fascinating, I guess. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah, he had his quirkiness. He did, you know, some odd things, but I, uh, I think when you have that much talent, when you're that brilliant, you know, you think of odd things to do and it's not odd to you. So, uh, but whenever, you know, the few times that I've seen him interview, he just, he was the coolest laid back, nicest guy, you know, mm -hmm. he had a, yep. a child that died. I mean, it was, uh, he's had a, he had a really tough life, but it was his mm -hmm. music that really, like you said, Amy, it brought everybody together. It really did. Yes, you know. it did. And the reason why they say there's a fine line between, you know. Genius and insanity. Genius and insanity, yeah. I mean, really, because they, I don't know. It's almost like a computer. Like, you know, they start bugging out when they're overloaded with. Their sensors get, get overloaded with too much stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, they I, just start doing quirky things. Yeah. yeah. It, I think the brain is a lot like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Einstein was a nut too. I mean, you could go back and and show all of these people uh, yeah. that had these massive IQs and were incredibly talented. And from what I understand, I read, and I, you know, again, kind of have to take everything with a grain of salt because you're not sure if it's true. But I read there was he, he had a vault of a, just a ton of unpublished music, and he just created constantly and I hope they're going to release more of it. I think they may have released some of it, but uh, he oh, wow. didn't have a will, didn't have a will. So I think there's been some battles going on there. Um, I believe he had a sister. I, you know, I better not say, cause I am not sure I need to look it up, but anyway, tomorrow we'll, we'll let you uh, know what's been going on in the true crime world. And then after the vigil, which I just put the link up, if you are in the Minnesota area, and um, in, in the, uh, not the Minnesota area, geez, Trisha, hello, in the uh, area, uh, it's right outside of Paisley Park in Minnesota. If you're in the Minnesota area, as opposed to Minnesota, the state, <laughs> I'm just tired, people. I'm just very, very tired. He Shay, thank you so much for the super chat. He Shay says, Fur Baby Fund. Thank you. I'm going to oh. need a big Fur Baby Fund when I move to Texas. I got to get carrying cases and all kinds of contraptions. So thank you very, very much. Oh, Justice Janie, I love that. You put up a whole bunch of purple umbrellas, purple rain. Love it, love it, love it. So thank you, Mary Rose. That's where it's at. It's at uh, Chanhassen. Is that how it's pronounced? In Minnesota. If you're in the Minnesota area, just somewhere on the border, you can go. No, it's in Chanhassen and... Um, it's actually on a, uh, hold on, I'm going to get you exactly where it is, because it's right here. I have it right here, people. It is April 21st, 9 p.m. Central at Riley Creek Bridge in Chanhassen, Minnesota, okay? Now, um, it says Prince fans from around the world will gather at Riley Creek Bridge to commemorate the five-year anniversary of Prince's passing. Follow the path in front of the fence in front of Paisley Park. It will take you to the Riley Creek Bridge. Candles will be provided. So there you go. If you are in the area of Paisley, uh, Paisley Park, I think it would be an emotional. Scrappy, leave him alone. I think it would be a, a very incredible and emotional event to go to. So yes, exactly. Red like wine again. Wear purple. Wear purple. Are you two? What are you two battling? What's going on here? <laughs> I think, well, I think Boo just wants to, you know, need, he likes to, you know, do this and, and his paws hurt or his, not his paws, his claws hurt. And I don't think he realizes, huh, I did a one. 
Are you needing there? Yes, he's needing there. He does that constantly. So, but he does it about 5.30 in the morning. He'll literally, I don't know where he leaps from. I think he gets on top of the fridge because it feels like I have 450 pounds of fur leaping on me, waking me from a sound sleep. And then he does this, you know, and it's like, uh, he doesn't want to eat. He wants to go outside and party. So I don't uh -huh. know what he's doing. What's going on in chat here, everybody? Everybody okay? They are um, reminiscing about purple rain and but what time in their life it came out. It's, it's like music and musicians are a marker for like, oh, well, absolutely. you know, this year, you know? Absolutely. Um, isn't it interesting that some, like, I can't recall a certain date or a time, but I can, a song can bring me back to a moment, like mm -hmm. every detail. Music is oh, yeah. that, like that, and I think that's why we get so attached to musicians, too. Exactly. Yeah. You hear a song, especially from your younger, from your youth, and boy, you're just transported right back there immediately. Yeah. yeah. One of mine mm -hmm. is, is, it's a one-hit wonder, and it's by a guy named B.W. Stevens, and it was called... My Maria, and um, it just takes me back to the summer of 73. I was 14. I had my first, like, real kiss with a boy on the beach. Aww. I know. And see, my middle name's Maria, so I thought it was nice. Justice Jenny, thank you again for that. I appreciate the, uh, the super chat, my dear. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'll go one. It's like 1999. <laughs> and who can forget who can forget julia roberts singing kiss in the bathtub in pretty woman oh. that was perfect oh she was a terrible singer but it was a <laughs> perfect scene oh yeah, doves, um, doves cry that's the best hi weathers rabbits oh i'm sorry am i ignoring you you have a window open so you can go outside okay you don't need to yeah see there you go. I don't need to get up and be your servant. All right. Good boy. It, yeah, absolutely. Moon, Moonlight View says sometimes people don't know how arduous being an artist really is. The touring is is brutal. And I've known a couple of people that have gone on tour. They're not really famous or anything, but uh, they were, you know, booked all over the country in small places. And oh, my, it was it sounded just miserable, you know. And I would even imagine, even if you have like your own jet and, you know, everybody around you taking care of everything, it's still exhausting because you have to go out there and give a performance and you have to give an mm -hmm. audience like a piece of you and it just drains you. you mm -hmm. know, just imagine. How about yeah. Yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to ignore you, uh, Amy. I'm talking to the cat here just a moment. Yeah. Hi, Lori. This says, Trisha, can you give me your email address? Yes, I can. And thank you for the super chat, my dear. It is Web Sleuth Videos, and I'll put it right up here. Web Sleuths, plural, videos, plural, at gmail.com. Okay. And uh, I, boy, I think that's about it, Amy, unless you have, oh, yeah, we do need to mention today. It's 420, and that is a big day for people who enjoy marijuana. I can't remember why. I was going to look it up, and I forgot. And, um, but also, unfortunately, it's another very sad occasion. Uh, 1999 in 1999 on this day, Columbine High School was shot up by, uh, Derek, not Derek. Oh, I got Derek. Dylan Klebold. Dylan and, Dylan Kle and, yeah. Thank you. And Sue Klebold has written a book, uh, and it's about the signs that she missed in her son. Uh, of him yeah. being so troubled. And it's an amazing book and you, your heart just breaks for her. Uh, you can if you've look, what seen her TED, if you've never seen her TED talk, it she she exposes her soft little underbelly and it's heartbreaking. All you need to do is type in Sue Klebold, uh, Klebold TED Talk. It should pop up pop up on YouTube. It's time for me to go. I can't even talk. I have been literally at this computer since about seven this morning and I have barely moved. So um, 
I'm a, it's amazing I can put a sentence together, let alone remember anything, huh, little boo. So, Amy, once again, thank you. You save me, my dear, whenever you come on. You are such a, a help and such a delight. I can't thank you enough. And everybody oh. in chat, you know I love you. Tomorrow, no noon or no 2 p.m. show. Why? Because I'm beat, people. I'm beat. I'm old and I'm beat. But we'll be back tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern. And remember, we'll have Charles Smith, cousin to Prince, grew up with Prince. And you're going to be pretty, uh, pretty astounded at the things he has to say. He's an amazing man. And he will call us after the vigil for Prince in uh, Minnesota. So, And if you go into the link, if you go into the description here, we'll have a link to all the information about the vigil if you if you are in the Minnesota area in the minute in the state of Minnesota and in the area and if you'd like to go not the well you see what I mean I'm telling people if you're in the area of Minnesota that makes no sense whatsoever <laughs> none 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 okay time for me to go time for uh time for me to just snuggle up with the fur babies and get some sleep okay my darlings thank you everybody and Amy thank you my dear don't hang up though okay Okay. Um, but and everybody, be safe out there. Wear your mask. Get your shots. Do all that stuff. Okay. Because I love you. I'll see you later. Bye bye. <laughs>